You're listening to the Back Home Network, presented by Homefield Apparel. And welcome, Hoosier fans, to another emergency episode of the Assembly Call as we have big breaking news in the world of Indiana basketball. And I know, I know, the news broke yesterday, but we were not able to hop on yesterday immediately following the commitment of Malik Renew to Indiana, Malik Renault uh, to Indiana. Uh, but we were able to get some folks together today to break down what this commitment means, what kind of player uh, Malik is getting. Uh, and just to, to talk through what is a very exciting day uh, in Indiana basketball. I'm Jared Morris. I'm here with the coach Brian Tonsoni, the coach Tony Adrania, and Ryan Phillips. And we are going to break this down for you here on this emergency episode. And guys, let's get right to it uh, because uh, I know, Ryan and, and Tony, that you guys have limited time with us today. Uh, so let's start with talking about the kind of player Indiana is getting. Uh, Malik is uh, a five star by some services, a four star by others, kind of in that 25 to 35 range, depending on where you look from Florida. He originally committed to uh, the University of Florida and then reopened his recruitment once Mike White left uh, for the Georgia job. Thank you, Tom Crean. Uh, and now he is here to be a front court building block for what Mike Woodson is building for Indiana. And so, Ryan, let's go to you first. Uh, what kind of player is Malik Renault? You know, I, I look, he's a super talented guy. I, I feel like, you know, when you get a five star, you're automatically thinking, okay, he's not going to be on campus very long. Malik doesn't project as a guy who's going to leave after a year. He's not that kind of the uh, kind of four star, four star, five star guy. Um, I, I think that what's interesting is you watch his game, and I think that Indiana fans are going to get a little bit of you know, uh, going to kind of hairs on the back of the neck going to stand up a little bit because some of the things that Trace Jackson Davis has been missing from his game similarly translate to Malik at this point. Now, he's not much of a shooter. Uh, he's 6'8", 210, so he'd be undersized as a back-to-the-basket sort of post. He can do that. But the difference between him and Trace Jackson Davis is that's not his game. He's not a guy who's just going to square off and and back go back to the basket uh, at 6'8", 6'9". Um he he's, was more undersized like two years ago and, and kind of grew a little bit. And I think that's why he's able to do more things. He hasn't just always been tall, uh, super tall. Um, but what, I, what I've been most impressed about is his ability to handle the ball at his size because he's not just tall, he's big. He doesn't have – I mean, he's probably got another 20 pounds he could, he could put on, but he's not, you know, he's not a wayfish high schooler. I, I think he's, he's got some physicality. He likes to play through contact. Um, one of the things that stood out to me, though, is, and I'm sure Tony will talk about this, is his ability, what he likes to do as opposed to go back to the basket is sort of catch the ball in the free throw line, three point area and go by you. And, 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 and he's more of a face up guy. Now, he's got to add a jump shot to that. That is something you just do not see on film from him is, is a jumper. I think his free throw form is solid which means that you can probably develop that into a jumper, but that's going to be the next level of his game is, is being able to add that 15 foot jumper to sort of give room for him to actually drive because guys are going to have to come up and guard him. As long as they're sagging off him, as we've seen with trace, it's harder to do work. I mean, trace has to do incredible amounts of work from the free throw line to get to the basket. He's good at it, but it's just a, a difficult transition when you don't have that jump shot. Um, one of the things I liked about him, he's, he's not a, uh, a ridiculous athlete. He's not one of those guys who's going to leap out of the gym, solid athlete, good length, all of that, but he's not just a guy who's just bouncy and needs to learn basketball. He's got a really high basketball IQ. He's really good at finishing around the rim with both hands. Uh, and again, through contact, he'll go odd angles with shots. He doesn't have to be a dunk or nothing. He, he, he uses the backboard really well. Um, he can swoop through the lane and find ways to put it in. He's not a guy who just needs that straight line to the basket. Uh, runs the floor really well. I, I've heard that from people who, you know, have watched him all season. He, he gets up and down the floor and is, you know, looking to finish. Um, pretty good passer for a big man at, at the top of the key. And he rebounds really well. He is He's a guy who just continually goes after rebounds and gets a lot of his points off offensive rebounds. Having talked to a few people who've watched him a lot, uh, he's a guy who just go go to the glass and – outworks people and is able to find it and finish. And so a lot of positives here for Indiana. And especially when you look at that depth chart, 
you were looking for another big guy and you had to find another big guy. That's what made Xavier Booker so important in 2023 as well. Look at the depth chart. Look at the roster in 2023. It's, it's, it's barren for another big guy needs another one. And Renault really fills that need. And also if you're looking ahead and Logan Duncan sticking around, those two guys can play together. There's they, they do different things. Both guys can move. Both guys can, can handle the ball. Both guys can take it away from the basket, which is what Mike Woodson wants. The question is, can those guys both start shooting the ball? They don't, again, don't have to be knockdown shooters, just have to have that threat of a jump shot to be able to space the floor out a little more. And I think that Renault is a guy who, who has, who will have that in his, uh, in his tool bag at some point. It's just a question of how quickly it comes. If Trace Jackson Davis winds up in the NBA or winds up, you know, turning professional, uh, he's going to need to develop that shot real fast. And if not, he might have, you know, a little bit more time to figure it out. Uh, but a great pickup, all praise to Kenya Hunter for just the work he's doing. I mean, he is just killing it. Three top 30 recruits in a year's time for Kenya Hunter. Give that man whatever raise he wants and keep him around as long as possible. Uh, just absolute work being done there and uh, did a great job and was able to get this kid on campus fast after the decommitment and reel him in real quick. And also, hey, uh, junior recruiter badge going to Jalen Hood Chipino, who uh, I know wanted his buddy to come play with him and, and was able to do work there too. Yeah, no, we may need to redirect some NIL money Kenya's way to, uh, to give him another raise because he's been great. Uh, let's get Tony Adrania's thoughts. Obviously, those of you who are in our private community probably just got the notification that uh, Tony's Malik Renault scouting report is up. I haven't had a chance to look at that yet. But if you are listening to this and you haven't joined the community yet, go to assemblycall.com slash community. Grab the bundle that includes IU Film Room because Tony does incredible work in there. Uh, scouting reports on recruits, scouting reports of upcoming opponents, uh, video breakdowns of IU games. It's all great stuff and will make you a smarter fan. Uh, so we're really fortunate that Tony's able to give us a few minutes here today also uh, to talk about some of the things he learned putting that scouting report together. So, Tony, uh, what do you see from Malik Renault that you like? And is there anything uh, that you don't like? Yeah, to start with what I like, I mean, first and foremost, and I think Malik said this himself in one of the interviews I read is kid's a winner. Um, you know, he's won two national championships um, at the highest level of, of high school basketball that there is. And, and I think that, um, you know, that goes a long way. We kind of heard Mike Woodson talk a lot of this year about like, got to get the guys over the hump, got to get the guys over the hump um, in terms of kind of like learning how to win. Um, I, I do think, well, obviously the high school and the college game are, are different. Um, having that winning pedigree um, is important. And, and you're getting two guys, uh, obviously, in Hood Shafino and Renault um, coming in. So I think that's obviously a, a nice plus to have is you're getting a, you know, a guy that's won at a very high level. Um, but in terms of his game, um, to echo a lot of what Ryan said, I think he has really, really good feet. For his size um i mean his footwork is phenomenal and i think it's why he's able to play with his back to the basket a little bit um at his size because he he kind of uses bigger guys height advantages against them um you know a lot of up and unders um and and just fantastic feet um for for his size and that's really what stood out to me in his game um with the, one of the first things i looked at were his feet um that sounds really weird and uh, I don't, I don't mean it in a weird way. Um, but Tony, the interesting thing is you talk about his footwork and you're absolutely right. And that, that's just something that impressed me, but also at his size and the fact that he's hasn't been that size for very long, that he's already that coordinated at that size is really interesting. I mean, cause he's, you know, he wasn't like six, two, but he was, you know, he's gotten to six, eight and has just transitioned to that size really easily. A lot of guys take time to sort of to fix that. And he's right there. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it's, that's, what's been awesome to see for me. And, you know, I watched five or six games of his uh, pretty much back to back to back. And that was one thing that just stood out time and time again, um, not only on the offensive end, but the defensive end, um, you know, he's not, he's not like a great athlete as Ryan noted, but he moves really well laterally. And so he can, he can keep guys in front of him and allows them to switch on the defensive end. And, you know, as we know, that's what coach Woods has been looking for. He wants guys with length. He wants guys that can guard multiple positions. Um, and check and check for Malik Renault. So, um, you know, great instincts. Like he's just, um, it's something that I noticed too, is like 
there was a couple times where like somebody was getting beat off the dribble and he would just kind of show just to like make sure that guy saw his presence and then get back to his man and like things that just don't show up in the box score, but impact winning. Um, you know, I tweeted that out today. I put it in the film room. Like he makes plays that impact winning. One of the clips I showcase, um, not a single thing he does would show up in a box score, but he starts out on the ball. He switches defenses on a ball screen. Um, and then a guy comes off a cut that's not even his responsibility. He just shows to make sure that guy doesn't get an open layup. Then he recovers to his man and he contests the shot and the guy ends up airballing it. Again, none of those things show up on a box score, um, but they now have possession and, and they can work there. So it's, it's really, really awesome stuff. Um, you know, it's, it, as Ryan also said, it's not a guy that's like a one and done recruit. Um, you know, it's a five star that projects to be there three or four seasons. And he's a guy that can make an impact for three or four seasons. And that's what's exciting about getting these high level guys um, to come in. And, and, you know, just the attitude, every interview I've talked or I've heard from the kid, um, he just has a really great attitude, great awareness about himself. And then you're bringing him in with one of his best friends and Jalen Huchifino, um, who's also just kind of a, a dog, if you will, like just a guy with a winning pedigree. Um, you know, as, as we said, like get, give Ken Hunter all the rays, you know, all the raises he wants. Give Mike Woodson, who, uh, you know, has obviously figured out this whole closing thing pretty pretty dang well, um, I'd say. And, and just that entire staff of being able to pull in three guys from these kind of basketball factories, if you will, within the last calendar year, um, pretty dang impressive. And, and, you know, I think there's a lot of optimism around the IU program right now, and I think it's obviously for good reason. Coach Tonsoni, to your coach's eye, what do you see that you like? In well, there's a lot of good commentary already, and I'm going to focus on uh, on some of the things. One, I think he's physically ready to come in and have some minutes to play some minutes. The number of minutes will depend on who stays and who goes and and, and how quickly he adapts to Coach Woodson's offense. But you see that both in, uh, those guys coming from the Florida program, uh, Hood Shafino is ready. They're physically uh, ready. Sometimes you get a lot of great high school AAU athletes, but they're a little skinny. They get knocked off the route. They get knocked off defensively. And, and I think the, the key thing as always with me is both of those guys seem defensively ready to, to compete. And again, playing defense, even at that high level is different than playing defense in the big 10. So there's a learning curve. But one of the things that I really, really like is that they both, um, uh, Weighted, uh, won the weight is, is what the coach that I work for uh, talks to us about sophomores and juniors who are behind guys who are uh, uh, better than them. Win your weight. Are you preparing to get better when your opportunity shows? Uh, and, and Renault wasn't even in at Mount Verde before, or Mount Verde, however you say it, before his junior year, came in, played off the bench. Had a really good Geico nat uh, uh, Nationals off the bench. Hood Shafino the same way. Then they got in, and that's what's going to happen at a high level uh, when you get into the Big Ten. Both of these guys may be five stars and asked to come in and get 18 to 22 minutes off the bench. They're both winners. They're both ready. To, they understand that winning the weight or winning their marginal minutes before they get the major minutes. Uh, from an X and O standpoint, I like his patience uh, in the post. Um, and, and I know that the, the Sigma move that Ryan talked about earlier, the catch and go and the face up move is awesome, but his ability to do a little, you know, show one shoulder, come back to another shoulder, both hands. Um, I think that's some of the stuff, uh, he's probably at a higher level than, than Duncan was coming out of Cincinnati Moeller. But one of the things I think we'll like about Duncan, once he gets ready to play is his ability to go off both, uh, both shoulders and both of those guys and Malik really, the word angles to me uh, is important. The ability to get angles with your body position so you're scoring at the basket, at the backboard, instead of just always relying on that crab dribble, uh, go up and over or go through people. He has the ability to get proper angles, which helps him get uh, opportunities at the rim. So a combination of things uh, it excites me uh, about this recruit. Ryan, you had something Yeah. To it, it, it he reminds me of a guy who in like two years you'd see dropping 25 for Villanova in the tournament. Like, you know what I mean? Like it's just a, a guy who you may not see flashy highlights of nationally all the time, but then comes up huge when you need him and has probably been solid all year. You just haven't been paying attention. You know what I mean? And, and so I think that's, and 
I, when I look at Huchifino, I feel like that way too. And, and look, I love the Villanova program and what they're doing. And I think he's getting Villanova type guys. Jalen Huchifino is a guy who he's not going to score 30 a game for you. Uh, he may not even get 10 assists in a game in his career, 10 or 12 assists in his career, in a game in his career, but he's going to be the guy that makes all the plays that make the offense run. And he's going to be the guy that finishes when he needs to. He's going to be the guy that can hit a shot for you when you need to. He's going to hit free throws down the stretch when you need him to. Like, And, and he's going to be a strong defender. I like, they're guys that do that are highly rated, but do all the things you need to do to win basketball games more than put up huge numbers and be an all American. It, it's so how are you going to build your program? Are you going to build it with the flashy guys who are going to go pro after a year? Or are you going to build it with the guys who win basketball games? Those are often choices coaches have to make. And look, I think that at where Indiana's program is, we'll take any five star that wants to come uh, at this point. But when you start picking and choosing guys, you pick the guys who will help you win basketball games. That's what you're most invested in as a college coach. You want guys to go to the NBA and be successful, but that's not your job. You know, part of your job might be preparing them to take that step, but your job is to win basketball games. And and Mike Woodson has brought in players now that will help you win basketball games. And that's all that matters for Indiana right now because you've got to continue to take that next step. As we talked about it a lot on the show this year, had to make the tournament this year. That was the step. Now you've got to take that next step. And to do that, You've got to have these kind of guys. All right, so we got a couple good audience questions here that I want to hit with you guys before you have to go. Tony, I'll send this first one uh, to you. How do you assess what Malik's impact will be next season in the event Trace stays and in the event Trace goes? Like, what do you see his role being? Yeah, I think regardless, he he projects somewhere in a you know a twenty minute per game type role. Um, now, whether that is more defensively or offensively, that, that can probably, um, hinder a little bit on, on Trace Jackson Davis. Um, because I do think obviously you're going to lose some offensive production there and, and race wouldn't be able to pick all that up at the five. And, and, you know, you might see, uh, Renault go into a starting four slot if JG is a three. I mean, there's so many variables in April. It's hard to, to, you know, to put a projection on it without me being completely wrong. <laughs> um, when it, when we well, don't know to... what the roster is going to look like, so it's hard to, you know, make those projections, but. Yeah, but I would say he certainly, you know, as coach said, and as Ryan said, he's got the body to play right away. He's got the skill to play right away. So, you know, he, he's in the rotation and he has an opportunity to, to make an impact in one way or another. And I know that's, that's not really answering the question. He's kind of no. safeguarding. Okay, himself, so but. okay, so let's say Trace comes back, right? We saw what Michael Durr did last year as the backup center. Malik would clearly be a step ahead of what Indiana got from Michael Durr, correct? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, and and, okay. and what you're going to see probably is the backup center would then be, and and Renault. I mean, like here's the thing: is this offense? You don't. You just need one post guy. You don't need two post guys you don't need a center and a powerful you know i mean it's just at six nine let's face it he's not going to be favoring footers every night i mean you know you have those guys occasionally but you could play renault at nominally center for five minutes if you need to uh probably just like you can run race thompson out there you can run you know whoever out there it's straight at, at center um but here's the thing if trace comes back i think you're definitely looking at a guy who's playing 20 minutes a game coming off the bench. And Mike, again, we talked about this year. Mike Wilson's going to have to start using his bench because you're promising a lot of guys a lot of things. You're going to have to start delivering on some of the minutes for your bench guys. You just don't have to use them all at the same time. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> uh, but you could see yes. Renault, you could, you could allow uh, Race Thompson to go back to the basket, allow Renault to play a little bit on the perimeter and, and, and drive off of that and, and maybe have them switch, you know, one in, one out kind of thing just to mix it up defensively or offensively. Um, if Trace doesn't come back, I don't think he's a starter right away. Uh, he might earn that by midseason, but I think that he's probably one of your first guys off the bench in that position. I think that if Trace doesn't come back, you're looking probably at Race at the five and Geronimo at the four in some capacity. Now, those don't have to be – Geronimo could be on the perimeter. That's all that – you know, like he, he's technically – maybe he's a, a wing post hybrid or, you know, whatever, because I know he wants to play three. Um, so, but I think that the Geronimo probably works his way into the starting lineup just because of his experience and some of the performances he had this year. And that means Renault is coming off the bench. I think he's sticking it for a bench role anyway, 
But I think it's going to be a high leverage bench role where he plays a lot of minutes. And if he's playing really well, maybe he's one of your closers, you know? Um, so we'll see. It's, it's all about where the season starts. Also, we have to see where the roster shakes out. We don't know if anybody else is going to transfer. We don't know if Trace is leaving or staying. So it, it's a long way to go there. Um, I think just the bottom line is when you look at these additions, the second unit we all had so many problems with last year when they were all in together is a heck of a lot better than it was last year already. And I do think uh, people have asked me about Huchifino, about whether he's going to start or whatever. I, I like, I don't think you get Jalen Huchifino if you don't tell him he's going to start as a freshman. I don't think anybody expected Xavier to the way he did. And so maybe when he committed, it was a wide open door to the point guard spot. And now he's probably going to be on the floor with Xavier. And I would assume Tamar Bates is the other perimeter guy. But, but you know, you can stagger the two point guards. Of minutes. course. No, and now yeah, yeah. you, you don't can have, have Huchifino play, other, play with Malik and they've already got some chemistry yes. together with a second no, unit. Absolutely. But what, what I'm saying is to start games, which uh, by the way, starting yeah. doesn't matter. It really doesn't. It's a, like a, a token thing is like an, it's like an honor you bestow. It's like being a captain almost or whatever. So that's what starting is. What matters is who plays the most and who finishes games is more important than who starts. So, but I do think if you're getting Jalen Huchifino, you probably told him you are going to be our point guard. And that's probably at the time when you decided that Christian Lander is not going to be your point guard for the future, which is why he's leaving. Um, so I would expect Jalen Huchifino to start. I, I just think that in recruiting these days, you have to promise things like that to get the win. And so I think Malik Renault knows he wasn't probably going to start given what's coming back, but is willing to take that, that, that role off the bench to start and then start maybe as a sophomore. So, so yeah, I, I think that you're, you're looking at a really interesting situation with the lineup. What do you do with that third perimeter role? I think it's gotta be Tamar Bates uh, just for the scoring punch. Um, but yeah, it really interesting setup that's coming, and we'll figure out what the what the lineup looks like as 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 the roster shakes out. One more question, Tony, for you before you have to leave. We talked about how Malik has the ability to face up. He's shown some ability to drive and to pass. Obviously, his biggest weakness and the thing he'll have to develop is the shooting. Based on what you've seen from his form, you know, any statistics that you've looked at, what's there to work with? Like, does he project to you as a guy who can become a credible? shooter if not from three-point range then at least from like 15 to 18 feet uh i'm biased here but the best thing he's got working for him is he's left-handed i mean that's <laughs> that's <laughs> another lefty wearing number five in the post for indiana guys <laughs> um no his, his free throw shooting i, I want to say he was around 80 percent this year um you know which which helps kind of project that he could be somebody in the low 30s at some point um in his career um you know i as a three it's point to, shooter, you mean? As a three, as a three point, point shooter, shooter, excuse me. Um, it's hard to say uh, just because just only being able to watch his you know five games of of what he's working on behind the scenes and, and you know Montverde they were very set oriented offense um, where he really kind of ran things as like I don't want to say a point forward but they would run a lot of things through him in the slot and the high post with dribble handoffs and you know it's just it's hard to know a guy's full skill set, especially when he's playing with so many other skilled guys. Um, you know, they, they had Whitehead and, and Hutch Fino and Renault and KJ Evans and all those guys that it, it's hard for a guy to showcase like his true skill set. So his shot might be more advanced than, than we know about. And maybe that's wishful thinking on my end, but I do think that he has the, he has this, the mechanics to project to be somebody that can stretch the floor um, and, and quite frankly, he, he's probably going to have to just being six, eight, a little bit undersized in the big 10. Um, and yeah, so I, I, I see no reason why a jump shot couldn't be developed mechanically. Um, and then obviously it seems like a guy that, that has already put in a lot of work, um, on his game and, and willing to, to kind of go that extra mile to, to help the program. Awesome. Tony, thanks for being here and jumping on. Make sure all, all those of you in the community go check out Tony's scouting report on Malik Renault. And if you're not in the community, join the community at assemblycall.com slash community. Appreciate your time, Tony. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one. Ryan, we're short on time with you too, correct? Yeah, I got to work, guys. It's the day job. Um, but I, I echo a lot of what uh, – by the way, go to thebigleague.com. That's, uh, um, That's right. But – 
Uh, yeah, I echo a lot of what Tony said. I think that he probably can develop a jumper. The problem, he didn't really take many. And that's because, again, he's surrounded by so many talented guys. They all had very specific roles to fill. And it wasn't sort of a freelancing thing where he could just step out on the floor and pull up for a jumper. It, it, and it doesn't show on his AAU film either. So I think it's just a guy who hasn't done a whole lot of it. Um, so we'll see. It's a mystery. He could step on campus and be knocking down 15 footers like it's no big thing, but we just haven't seen it. And so it'll be interesting to see how that develops, how much of a priority Indiana makes it right away. Um, but yeah, they got to figure out, uh, they got, they got to figure out, you know, what he can do from that aspect because it changes the offense if he can, if he can knock down those jumpers. Let me throw a couple names out at you real quick as we get you out of here. Cause everybody likes to kind of get player comps if they haven't seen a guy just to get some frame of reference. You know, you talked about his post moves and his footwork, which I think reminds you of Juwan Morgan some when you watch him. Uh, when you see him, you know, get the ball from outside the three-point line and drive guys into the lane. Reminds you a little bit of what Marco Killingsworth used to do uh, for Indiana. When you talk about defensively what he can do, there's a lot of Race Thompson there and doing mm-hmm. a lot of the stuff that's not on the stat sheet. Dirty work. Let me throw out a potential comp as a ceiling for Malik Renault and tell me if you think it's viable. If his outside shot develops... Can he be like a Xavier Tillman was for Michigan State? Yeah, that's not bad. Um, that's not that's not a bad one. I, I now, he, Xavier Tillman was never the post guy. I think Malik is, and Malik may never be able to right. be that level of shooter. But just in terms of impact on both ends of the floor and a real mature game, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of the guy that kept coming up to me when I watched him play. It's not bad. You know, you know who in some ways he reminded me of a little bit offensively and what he wants to do, not what he can do, because I, I don't think this guy was actually good at doing this, but in how he wants to play. You remember how Noah Vonley really didn't like posting up and would always want to catch the ball at the three point yes. line and go to work there. I think that's what Malik prefers. Now he can do work in the post, but I think that he's not used to it yet because he hasn't been six eight for that long. And so you see him on offense and he can handle the ball in the perimeter like Von Lee could. He can pass the ball. He can dribble the ball and he can take it to the hoop. And, and I feel like that was what I was getting. I was like, oh, sometimes you should just go to the block, you know? And, and I remember Von Lee never got good position and things like that. Renault does all that. He gets good position. He works angles. One thing I was really impressed with him is he'll still be getting position on guys when a shot is in the air. And that's why he's such a good offensive rebounder. His guy will move off him to sort of like shade over and he'll dive in underneath and get position as the ball is coming, you know? And so he's, he's continually working on that. A guy who used to do that was Tyler Hansbrough. You know what Tyler Hansbrough used to get offensive rebounds and people would say like, Oh, he just outworks people because he did like, you know, he got <laughs> annoying because yeah. you hear that guy and you look at him and you're like, okay, of course they're going to say that guy works harder than everybody, but he did. And, and I remember watching him on the floor in at the Maui Invitational Shots would go up, and he'd still be just jostling for position. Everybody else was watching the shot. Renault does that, and he he works for the ball. And and what they do is it's annoying if you're a defender because you're just like trying to get position and find the find the ball, and they're digging in and pushing you away and finding a way to do it. So there's a lot of guys that there are aspects of his game that it reminds me of. Um, but Tillman's not a bad one. Um, he is going to have to be able to shoot to to live up to that comparison. That's what I'm saying. That's like the ceiling. Can knock down if, he, yeah. if he becomes a 40 percent three point shooter, and I'm not saying I project that, but just yeah. when you when you try and think about that. By the way, no, great but- stat from Trevor Andershock at Peaks, uh, who did a really nice scouting report. I don't. I I'm not sure if this was just at Geico or there was some you know some sample that he looked at, and Malik Renault's offensive rebounding percentage was like 30 <laughs> percent. Yeah, in, that's an insane number. I mean, yeah. He's a really good Silly. offensive rebounder. Silly. And he, he had a high like block percentage and things like that too. I mean, he's he he works, and that's why he's gonna fit this. I mean, you know, when Race Thompson leaves, you're gonna still have a guy who works and does all that stuff you need to do that doesn't show up in the box score. And, and we said this year at times, Race Thompson is the most important player on this uh, on this team because of all the things he does that nobody else does, or that you know, he encourages other guys to do, or the the, the vibe yeah. that he gives off. So Hey, now, now all Indy has to do is get the clean sweep and get KJ Evans for 2023. I mean, it's, let's go, you know, easy, right? It's a layup at this point. Just go get him. Which, and maybe we'll get you out of here on this point, you know, as you look at, okay, what is the role going to be for Jalen Hitchafino? What is the role going to be for Malik Renault? Recruiting. Well, if you're, if you're recruiting, no, no, but what I'm saying is if you're recruiting a top 10 guy from Montverde, 
who clearly is going to be communicating with Jalen Huchifino and Malik Renault, even if he's not as good of friends as those guys, you're going to be giving those guys a role. You're not going to like bury them on the bench and then be recruiting KJ Evans to come in, you know? Yeah. So, and I think they're going to be good enough to get it anyway, but you know, I just think that's something to to keep in mind as you kind of project forward for what Huchifino and, and Malik Renault are going to be able to do. And look, you know, they're you going to play like there's they're like, going to play. And here's the thing, like we we harped on Woodson's bench use this year. He cannot do the thing where his bench guys get six minutes a game this year. Cannot do it. From the jump, your bench guys from the, in the non-conference schedule need to be getting 20, 15, whatever it is. They need to be playing and preparing you for later in the year where they're going to have to play. And, yeah. and that's that's one part of his coaching that has to evolve this year. And, and you know, hopefully – Somebody comes from the outside and 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 is like, hey, this is something. And maybe he knows it himself, but something this has to change because we saw it early in the season in some of those games where he was playing his starters more than thirty minutes a game, and it's like that doesn't you can't do that in college basketball for too long. And 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 plus, if you've got these talented guys on the bench, it keeps your starters fresh to stretch. Yeah. I mean, it works. There's a reason you recruit these guys. There's a reason you recruit Tamar Bates. There's a reason you, you bring these guys in. You got to trust them once you bring them in. And, and that's, I mean, if you're, if you're, if you're going out putting all the work to get these guys, it's not so they can sit on the bench for three years and play as seniors. It's so they can help you now and develop into those all American, all big 10 type guys. You got to start with the work now. Ryan, thanks for joining us. Go to the big lead.com everybody. Uh, and I'm assuming you'll be on Thursday night for a more expanded scouting I will report. Be. Of I will be. Awesome. Thanks Later, for being guys. here, man. See you, Ryan. All right, uh, Coach. Real quick, let's uh, let's talk about the sponsor, the presenting sponsor for this show, as always. Home field apparel. Well, I'm for the team. That's right. This ep uh, episode of the Assembly Call, uh, like all episodes of the Assembly Call, and all episodes of the Back Home Network presented by our friends at Home Field Apparel, where they have the largest collection of vintage IU apparel that you will find anywhere with awesome shirts like this little 500 shirt. I don't know if you can see it. Little 500 is this weekend. I'm wearing my shirt. They've got that and so many other great shirts with uh, old, great Indiana logos on them. And the best part is that not only are they great designs and not only can you get hundreds of schools beyond just Indiana, but no matter what you buy, it's going to be comfortable. The colors last through many washings and you're supporting an Indiana based company that came up through Kelly. And there really isn't anything better than that. Plus, if you've never ordered from Home Field Apparel before, you can go there, homefieldapparel.com and use our promo code HOME, H-O-M-E, to get 15% off your entire first order. That's promo code HOME. For 15% off, again, the website, homefieldapparel.com. Wear one for the team. There's something for everybody. Go there, see what's for you, see what's for your friends, and use that promo code HOME to get 15% off. So, you know, Coach, this is – it's just an exciting time right now to be an IU fan. Um, and I think it's important, you know, to mention, you know, we're sitting here in April. Right. And so we're getting excited about recruiting. And, you know, you, you mentioned that on Twitter. And a lot of times you'll get responses from folks. It's like, well, it only matters if, you know, if they win games come the season. Yeah, we know. <laughs> like, that's all that matters. Right. None of the stars, none of the numbers of your ranking mean anything if you don't win in November and December and January and February and March. But we are here in April. And the truth is, recruiting and roster construction the work that is done now for recruiting and roster construction goes a long way towards winning those games and i think what we're seeing you know in just a year on the job is you know mike woodson pretty quickly turning this roster over in his image you know with higher rated recruits with guys that fit the way he wants to play basketball which is bigger, longer athletes that can do multiple things that can, you know, attack the basket and can, you know, can just play a different style than what we've seen. And there's a couple stats that are really impressive for what he's done. Here's the first one, which is that if Trace decides to return for his senior season, and that seems like about a 50-50 proposition at this point, it really does. You know, there's good arguments to make on both sides. He's got to see you know, where he's projected in the draft and what kind of NIL he can get and all that stuff and weigh all that. But if he does come back 
Indiana is going to have four players on its roster who were ranked in the top 35 in the RSCI, which basically like pools together all the different recruiting rankings. Four players in the top 35. That has never happened in the 24-year history of the RSCI database. So the high-end talent will be as good or better as it's ever been, at least based on the recruiting rankings. It would be just the sixth time in the last 24 seasons that we would have had four top 50 players on the roster, and only the fourth time that IU would have seven top 100 players on the roster. And that means that even if Trace leaves, you know the talent is still going to be on par with some of the best teams IU has had in the last 25 years. So I think the reason why there's so much optimism right now among IU fans is you can really see a different level of talent being added to the roster. And basically three of the 13 highest rated recruits that Indiana's had since 1999, Mike Woodson's gotten commitments from them in the last year. He's, he's getting it done on the recruiting trail. He's getting it done from a roster construction standpoint. And you're starting to see this come together into a roster that you can take into higher level games and compete, which hasn't always been the case the last few seasons and, and, and even beyond that. Yeah. You, you need dudes. Um, it's as simple as that. And, and you need athletic, uh, wings and, and guards. And, and even, you know, we've talked a lot about your, your multifaceted post play, uh, your ability to score with your back to basket, your ability to catch face up and, and get to the rim, your ability to pick and pop and shoot the three. That's just where the game is at right now. Um, uh, multiple dimensional, uh, players. And, and when you have, uh, some players that don't fit that, then you really got to maneuver your offensive philosophy and your scheme and all of those things. And even your defensive uh, philosophy and scheme to meet the players that you have, but it's always going to be better when you have athletes. And I think that really shows last year when eventually the players come back, your Galloway's, your Geronimo came uh, and started playing better uh, and, and Rob to what Rob could bring defensively. But when those players were back healthy, it added a new dimension to Indiana basketball. And while they didn't win at a high percentage, they played really good basketball their last 11 games. So we're very competitive. The games they lost were right at the buzzer uh, until the last one, uh, obviously, uh, in, in the tournament. So you add better athletes and you five-star athletes in Hood Shafino and, and Malik uh, Renault and, and going after this uh, Dennis uh, guy from uh, Wichita State. Those are the types of players that I think Coach Woodson will feel more most comfortable putting into what he wants to do offensively uh, and then what he gathered this year offensively. But just having athletes uh, opens up uh, the creative side of coaching uh, so much more with what you can do offensively. And for example, what Montverde did um, with, with their two bigs, their other big, I think is uh, going to Duke. Uh, they inverted them at times. Uh, they, they brought Renault out at the four. And as Tony said, did some slot to slot passing and then worked with him out of the slot. Uh, and he was good at feeding the post and, and, and doing things, driving and kicking off of that. And then there were times where the advantage was for Renault to be low and, and they inverted that. We saw that in the final four, the importance of being able to do that. When Kansas inverted their offense in the second half, they closed a 15 point gap and was able uh, to, to go. So that gives some flexibility that, I don't think last year's roster had the flexibility with, with the lack good basketball players. So I don't focus on the stars. The stars are all great and it does build excitement. And it's, and obviously you have better chances with the better stars. Uh, obviously yes. uh, the recruiting does services correlate to winning. <laughs> yes, it does eventually, but not every five star as we know all too right. well, uh, not all five stars are ready to play right away as Tamar probably wasn't ready to play major, major minutes, even if we disagreed with his minutes usage. And then, you know, Lander, obviously, uh, the, the coming too early wasn't the right thing. And so not all five stars, but these guys have bodies which don't need to be developed right away. They Everyone had mentioned an IQ, and, and it's tough to coach IQ. Um, but but the, way, the way Renault moves in the post and, and his ability to go to both sides and his angles, th those are skills that when you – if you enter college with those, uh, I, I think that's great because – the post game is the most undertaught uh, skill. Uh, we all work on our, our dribble moves and our shooting, but the ability to get open, stay open, and then make a move to finish, uh, that's, I think, even in the college game, it, now with athletes just jumping up and going over, 
But uh, both Duncan and, and Renault have that ability to get those angles. So the winning mentality, the, the defense that these guys bring. So we're bringing in those stars from the recruiting agencies, but we're bringing them in that have those non-measurables. Um, and I think that impacts winning just as much as the measurables. And look, I'm all for being patient with freshmen. And I don't, you know, I think we, we all on this show – generally expect Jalen Huchifino and Malik Renault to have important roles on the team. You know, not starring roles necessarily, especially if Trace comes back, but to play significant minutes in a supporting type role. And, you know, I know there, there's been some pushback on that. And part of that is because Indiana's two most recent five stars, Tamar Bates and Christian Lander, haven't come in ready to live up to those expectations. You know, when Christian Lander was a freshman, he was, you know, as we talked about with Alex Bozich, they put him in their top 25 players in the Big Ten list you know which seems laughable given what christian did in his first season um but i would caution folks that you know just because christian and tamar weren't ready doesn't mean that jalen and malik won't be ready and they come in you know coming from different situations and you know just look previous to that trace came in and he was ready you know noah vonley came in he was ready to produce early on romeo langford came in and was ready to produce early on and so you have to really look at each guy individually and i think what gives you some confidence that those two guys can come in right away is a, the maturity that they showed at Montverde, as you said, you know, being guys who accepted a reserve kind of role player role their first year there, and then stepped into starting roles. And frankly, just their physicality and the way they play. Like you can, a lot of it is just look at a guy's body, Christian Lander and Tamar Bates, their bodies weren't ready for college basketball. Jalen Huchifino and Malik Renault would look, they would not look out of place on a college basketball court right now. And that's a big part of it, that mental and physical maturity. They seem to have it. Now, we'll see. I know, again, time will tell. You know, you have to actually see it on the court. But I think that's why we feel comfortable projecting those guys um, to have roles because they seem to have some of the qualities that other guys who have succeeded early on have had. And so they should be ready to step in and play. Yeah, absolutely. And there's some good comments going on in the chat too. And I, I don't want to bring this back up, but the positionless basketball, um, you know, Geronimo wants to play the three, but he can play more perimeter and be the fourth guy out on the field, on the field, on the court. Um, I just think you're going to see things more spread out. Uh, and, and obviously the major thing in coach Woodson's offense is the point guard. Cause he's going to initiate everything and you, and off the high pick and roll action, that's an important spot. That's going to be a defined spot in Coach Woodson's. But the other three, the two threes and fours, if they can drive, if they can do something, and I think Geronimo fits a role in that. I think Malik fits a role in that. Maybe not out to the three-point line right away, but his ability to catch in the slot in the short corner to face up and do some things provides threats, which still will space the floor uh, somewhat for what Coach Woodson wants to do. So they're – there is enough talent now and enough ability to spread out um, where they play and how they play that I think, again, it goes back to the creativity of what Coach Woodson would like to do. I think it gives them a lot of flexibility, and that can only make uh, uh, Indiana better. So here's a couple of other statements, both of which are true. Number one, the three-point shooting that Indiana projects to have next season seems to put a cap on how good this team can be. So as excited as we are, you know, there is still a big gap in terms of proven high volume three point shooting that you kind of need to have if you're going to, you know, go deep in March. OK, um, but the other statement that I think is true is Indiana is going to enter next season as one of the contenders for the Big Ten title. You know, I don't know where exactly they're going to be because we have to see who's back and who's not. But I will be shocked if Indiana isn't in everybody's top three or four, because frankly, when you just stack up the talent. Indiana is going to have as talented a roster as maybe anybody but Michigan, depending on who comes and goes from Michigan. And at the end of the day, talent usually wins out, you know, even if you have a glaring talent hole. And so those, you know, I think it's important to remember that because, you know, you know, a lot of times people say, OK, well, you know, they still don't have guys who can shoot the three. And that is true. And that is going to hurt them at times. And there's going to be certain matchups that's going to hurt worse than others. And it probably does prevent this from being a team that you would say, hey, this is a potential Final Four team. I think anybody could be with the right matchups. But I do think it's fair to say, and I'm curious if you agree, based on what we project to have coming back, especially if Trace comes back. But I think even if Trace doesn't come back, 
you know, this is a team that you would look at next year as a top four team in the Big Ten and a second weekend NCAA tournament team. Like basically a team that should be between 15 and 25 in the top 25 and be in the top four in the Big Ten. And part of that is because of what projects to come back in the Big Ten, which is still a league that is devoid of talent in, you know, in some respects. Um, but I think those two things are going to end up being true once we get to November and the season opens. Yeah, and I, I'm a little cautious to say top four because sometimes in a conference, if people pop uh, in teams and, and, you know, depending on the unbalanced schedule, you know, if the conference is good and you finish fifth or sixth and, and have a good run, I, I could see that happening. And that doesn't mean Indiana took a step backwards by any means. Heck, we were ninth, yeah. right? I'm so that might be the ceiling. The, I might agree yeah. with you. That's the ceiling. Yeah. If everything meshes and, and we get out of, of what we do. Um, but I'm not going to be bashful to say that the expectations are you're going to have a run uh, at, at being one of the better teams in, in, in the Big Ten. Um uh, but the Big Ten traditionally has has reloaded and done some things and is is highly competitive uh, in those ways. The three point thing is always interesting because I agree with you too. We haven't necessarily recruited that knockdown dead eyed shooter, but I w- I just thought now and I I'm going to go back and, and look at it maybe for Thursday show or when I'm on next about what was our three point shooting the last eleven games. Um, was it better once Galloway came back? Was it better once Rob got back and we had multiple drivers of the basketball? Um, what, what did we shoot in that stretch where, you know, the only game that we were out of was the last game against, uh, St. Mary's. And if you take that one out and just say big 10 tournament and, and the Wisconsin and Ohio state and those games, boy, our offense seemed a lot more smooth, a lot better, uh, overall. Yes. Trace, uh, was a monster in the big 10, uh, and we had Geronimo and those things, but, um, you know, you get some guys that can now, what, what are you going to do to guard Indiana? Okay. If, if, if you have a post presence, either race or tra- TJD, you're going to double. Well, then when you double who you're going to double off of, then the ball gets kicked out and, and you're going to have to close out short now because certain guys are going to catch that, that kick out and redrive, you know, and at a time you could just stick on Parker and Miller cop and you were daring X to take bad shots and, and miss and then when X got hot and then you could, so all of a sudden, all of these athletes prov- provide a different scheme for the defense, which might mean even more open shots. And I know we had open shots this year and missed, but the three ball might go in without getting that defined shooter, just slightly better enough for us to win a few, few games. But I do agree. I, I, I would like to see us not in the eight, nine game uh, in the big 10 tournament. And I'd like to see us have buys in a top four team that that is going to be a goal. Um, but we're going to have to see how this all fits in and how those freshmen can, can adapt. And there's, you know, obviously with what happens with X and, and his situation, that could be a, a blessing in disguise. If, if you can get some guys some playing time early. So when he returns, uh, if there is a, a, a game situation, suspension situation. So a lot of these things factor in, but, uh, obviously the roster moves Indiana up in the big 10 pecking order. So the next thing to look at here is that Indiana is not done looking at potential additions for next season. Uh, Dexter Dennis, I believe, is on an official visit right now. Uh, Sean McNeil, I believe his first name is Sean, um, from West Virginia, is projected to visit uh, this weekend or a little five weekend. Both of those guys would be transfers who are immediately eligible. But, you know, with Malik Renault's commitment, Indiana is at the maximum of 13 scholarships if Trace Jackson davis comes back and obviously if trace jackson davis wants to come back there will be a scholarship waiting for trace jackson davis to come back now what is going to make this a little bit awkward is trace is going through the process of getting feedback from the nba and appears very serious about figuring out if the timing is right for him to go now or if he should come back and because of the roster indiana has and what they could do with trace and the nil opportunities he has and kind of the tenuous position where maybe he's a late second round pick, but can he get a little bit earlier? We don't know. It's a tricky decision for him. And the deadline for him to make that decision is sometime out in June or, you know, somewhere. But the deadline for players to announce that they are going to transfer and be immediately eligible to play next year without sitting out is May 1st. Why is that important? Well, let's say that Dexter Dennis, who is on his visit right now and who the coaching staff apparently really likes for his length and defense. He was the you know defensive player of the year in his conference last year. Uh, at one time, shot 40% from three-point range as a freshman, even though last year his numbers were a little bit down. If he commits, 
Well, now if you know you're at 13 scholarship players guaranteed for next season, and if Trace decides to come back later, that would be 14. What would you do with that scholarship crunch? That is now you know what what you would have to look at. Um, and there are obviously no easy answers there. And again, it's complicated by the fact that you know if someone currently on the roster were to be uh, you know were to move on or kind of be forced to move on to make room for Dennis so that you still save the scholarship for Trace, well, they're going to need to announce that by May 1st so that they could play immediately next year and transfer to a new school. So the timing of all of this is really interesting. Um, but the staff certainly you know, seems to be keeping its options open. Um, and so that's what to watch for. Obviously, if you get no commitments from a Dexter Dennis or from a McNeil, uh, then you know we're at 12 scholarships and you wait to see what Trace does um, and then you're at 13. But if there is a commitment from one of those guys, now there's a potentially sticky situation if Trace decides to come back. Um, and we're just going to have to see that play out, um, you know, and, and you know, I, I wrote about it, you know, today in the in the community. Um, I don't like the idea of anybody who's currently on the roster, uh, you know, potentially being forced to move on if they don't want to uh, for whatever the marginal improvement is that you would get from Dexter Dennis or Sean McNeil. Um, but I suppose it's, it's just something to watch out for because that's really kind of the next roster domino to fall as we start projecting forward. Yeah, you know, we talked about this before we went on on air, and I'm like you. You know, if you come to Indiana and you want to stay at Indiana, I think it's uh, honorable to 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 keep that commitment for for the young man. Uh, on the other hand, it's college basketball, and you need dudes, uh, and, and it's a high free agency. Whether we like it or not, uh, we can sit here and complain about the portal or the rules or whatever. It's basically free agency, and you can restock your team any way you want in a given year. And the bottom line is winning. Uh, and, and from a basketball perspective, you have to make decisions from a basketball perspective to win basketball games. And then the question is how much do you attach them to doing the right thing off the court with honoring scholarships and, and, and those types of things. And um, that that's just a tough question. I would air. I think there's enough talent. If TJD doesn't come back and Dexter Dennis does, I think there's enough, you know, that's easy, solvable. Um, my old fashioned way is if TJD comes back, then the roster set with the people who have committed and you don't run anybody off, but, um, you know, you got to play with the big boys somewhat. And, and I would not be surprised to see, uh, someone enter the transfer portal May 1st, just as a precaution, maybe. Um, so that they can play next year and, and maybe keep open the, their mind to, come back with the decision of TJD out there. You always run the danger of being one short then TJD on, you know, right before June 1st says he's going to go to the draft and the person who is being, you know, now re-recruited who left uh, before the May 1st deadline decides, Hey, I am going to go somewhere else. Now you're down. Um, you're down, but I'm sure the staff has contingency plans uh, maybe even in the portal for that. They would not be bringing these guys in if there wasn't some well thought out plan. You're not just going to, I don't know if there's limits. Um, I know at one point there were limits on how many uh, campus visits you could have in recruiting. And I'm not an expert on all those recruiting rules, but I don't think you bring two guys in for one particular spot, a wing spot that you're looking to fill. If you didn't think you had a plan or somewhat of an idea and we're not privy to that. Yeah. Um, I don't like running players off from a just from a standpoint, but I also like winning, and that's that boy that that catch twenty two thing with, with 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 how do you how do you handle that? Uh, because if you if you run people off, that hurts recruiting as well down the stretch. And then the last thing I'll throw out is I've always been a proponent of maybe you only need eleven scholarships and you fill it at twelve and thirteenth with a third year, fourth year guy who who might pop in year three or four and keep them around because of minutes. Uh, and because if you don't play people, they're going to go to the, the portal. So do you need 13 top quality athletes to fill your scholarship? Do you not have enough basketballs for that? And do you want to juggle that portal every year where you just say, I'm going to fill it with 11, try to get 11 guys, some sort of play, some sort of progress and keep thir you know 12 and 13 as those team guys, glue guys. Uh, I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see year two, three, four of the portal, how people keep, um, keep reacting to this in the, in the college game. 
Yep, just something to keep an eye on, but we should have some clarity uh, on you know what those two guys are going to do here over the next couple of days. Um, we will see, but look, this is an exciting time. I mean, Indiana is stacking its roster with the kind of talent that we haven't seen in a long, long time, and typically when that happens, uh, it's not a guarantee that better days are ahead, but boy, the numbers sure do seem to correlate. Uh, you know, and, and look, all this talk about, you know, Malik Renault and Jalen Huchifino and what they can bring, uh, you know, Caleb Banks is a pretty good recruit in his own right. And CJ Gunn may step right onto the court and be the best shooter on the program. So, you know, and, and look, we've seen guys who, you know, come right on and outperform, you know, their recruiting ranking. And so those guys could have bigger impacts than we think, but you know, the athleticism has been upgraded. The overall talent level has been upgraded. I think we have more guys who can do more things. And when you really think back about the last kind of five or six years of Indiana basketball, what does it look like when you think about it? It's a lot of one dimensional players trying to function in a one dimensional offense. And that just doesn't work very well. And, you know, why was the offense over the final couple weeks of last season more dynamic and fun to watch? Because you started to see guys do more than one thing. You saw Trace Jackson Davis have multiple ways to score. You saw Xavier Johnson have multiple ways to, to beat an offense or, you know, to beat a defense uh, combined with a really strong defense. And so I think, you know, no matter what, Indiana's defense, I think, is going to be at least as good as it was last year, if not better, uh, especially if Trace Jackson Davis comes back. And just based on the, the personnel that we have coming in, it certainly seems like the offense is going to be more dynamic, you know, how high does that how high of a ceiling is it? How much will Indiana improve? Obviously, we wait to see. But I think at this point, based on what's happened recruiting wise, there is every reason to believe that what we see on the court next year is going to be better than what we saw on the court this year and that the steps forward will continue in Mike Woodson's second season. And I'm not sure what else you could really ask for on April 19th. Coach, your final thoughts here as we close up. Yeah, it's just it, it's just fascinating to get these guys from these schools in Florida uh, that other schools have gotten in, in the past, and, and and you are building a roster of, of athletes. That is exciting because I think that's what we watch when we watch the Sweet Sixteen and when we watch the Final Four is athletes, and different schools go about it different ways. Ryan mentioned the Villanova uh, stuff. You know, that's my preferred method of, of getting a bunch of guys that play two, three, four years, red shirt, some of that, and just play fundamentally strong guard and can score in multiple ways. I think we're headed that way. And that, that excites me. Are we better? Yes. Woodson is killing it on recruiting on the defensive side. And I got to trust him to do a little better on the offense and, and that, but maybe it's just both the bench and the offense, the stuff we've been critical of. Maybe it's because he didn't have that faith in the quality that was um, on the bench. So uh, it's, it's a good time to be an Indiana basketball fan. That's for sure. By the way, you mentioned Colin Gillespie or Villanova. There was a great tweet from Colin Gillespie. He was like, yeah. he had like the transfer portal and like, you know, shaking my head or something. The grass isn't always greener. Yeah. Yeah. When you're at Villanova. <laughs> exactly. You're not leaving there. You're leaving Villanova. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the grass may be greener at other places. <laughs> Not at Villanova. Um, all right. Hey, thanks, everybody, for being here. Thanks to Tony. Thanks to Ryan. Make sure you check out our friends at homefieldapparel.com. Use that promo code HOME for 15% off. By the way, if you're looking for more uh, Indiana basketball talk uh, to listen to, I saw that a new episode of Podcast on the Brink popped up with Galen Clavio talking with Alex Bozich. Haven't had a chance to listen to it yet, but with those two guys, it's got to be good uh, to listen to. And then also make sure that you check out assemblycall.com slash community. I'm telling you, the work that Tony Adranya does in there is awesome. I mean, it is really, really good stuff. Uh, you know, well worth the price. You can put up with my, you know, ramblings and random musings that I post. Sift through that, wade through that to get to Tony's stuff. And it is, it is very much worth it. Assemblycall.com slash community. Uh, coach, thanks for your time. Appreciate it. And I don't know who's going to be on Thursday night, but we will have a show Thursday night talk more about this probably get some different people on get some different perspectives uh as we continue talking about what has been an exciting indiana basketball off season uh and still has some question marks left to be answered as we move forward so take care everybody thanks for being here uh keep your as always keep your elbows in and your eyes on the rim and go hoosiers <laughs>